Good afternoon uh, and a very warm welcome to our second Saints talk of this semester, uh, which is Understanding Bird Migration with Professor Will Cresswell. My name is Alex Hayes. I'm Deputy Head of Development here at St Andrews, uh, and I'm delighted to say that we have an excellent turnout uh, this afternoon of alumni, parents and friends for Will's talk. Uh, I'm delighted, but not at all surprised, uh, as his research is really fascinating, not just in terms of the insights he brings to the habits and prodigious migratory feats of individual species, uh, but also with respect to how human activity is affecting those species. Will is Professor of Biology at St Andrews University and has been studying the ecology of migrant birds for the last 25 years. Current research priorities are to understand the factors determining the density and distribution of Palearctic migrants wintering in West Africa, so that we can address their continuing declines in the face of anthropogenic habitat and climate change. As part of the solution, he's involved with capacity building in the region through helping to run the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute that trains future African ornithologists. But first and foremost, he is a bird watcher. He's been birding for 42 years. He has three lists, a world list, a village list and a garden list and those currently stand at 2,499, 235 and 140 respectively, at least as of a few days ago. Um, those are all work in progress and perhaps the 2,500 milestone has already been reached uh, or will be revealed uh, shortly. Perhaps. Um, I've been privileged to join Will a couple of times uh, on a boat house in St Andrews Bay, where in between fielding idiotic questions from me about things like the breeding habits of the East Nukes curlews, um, short answer, they're not, which is a worry. Uh, he would periodically lock into what seemed to me like a, a barely discernible dot skimming over the waves in the distance. And they would then follow a brisk uh, but utterly comprehensive exposition of what the bird was, where it had come from, uh, where it had likely stopped along the way and its intended final destination. Uh, it was all uh, rather humbling. Uh, Will's research focuses on understanding how the one third of the bird species that breed in Europe are actually African species, which is where they spend most of their year. Swallows, flycatchers, warblers, swifts, cuckoos and so on move on a, on a global scale, connecting us with the rest of the world. But this annual migration marvel that brings tropical species to our backyards each year brings a number of scientific and conservation challenges. How do the individuals make it to Africa and back? Where do they go in Africa? And how can they cope with the different environments in Europe and Africa and those along the way? How can we do something about their almost universally declining populations when they range over many countries and two continents? Will's talk will describe some of his research to answer these questions. He will speak for about half an hour and then you will have the chance to ask him questions. So please do so by uh, submitting those in the chat bar, which you'll see on your screen. Uh, and we will wrap up by uh, about 6.15. So uh, without further ado, over to you, Will. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming and listening. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes about understanding bird migration. And please don't feel gloomy, because although I'm startled by saying migrants are disappearing before our eyes and there's been a fantastic decline in lots of migrant species over the last 50, 60 years. Spotted flycatchers, for example, on the left here, um, have declined in Scotland, in the UK, by 80% since, since I was a boy. And that's huge numbers of birds that have disappeared, and we need to understand why. But to cut right to the chase, migrants are fantastic, and they are surviving, and there is some good news in all of this. But nevertheless, we do have what appears to be a crisis in front of us as these common birds are disappearing. So here's a white throat, common white throat. If I was to walk out of my house uh, into my back garden, I might find a common uh, white throat. It's a very familiar Scottish uh, species. But this species is only here for some of the year. It's here for the summer. And in fact, if you plot out the time spent for something like a white throat in Scotland, 
it's actually a relatively small proportion of their life. The other proportions, they're migrating between Scotland and Africa, where they actually spend most of their time. And one third of European species are actually African birds, by the definition that they spend most of their time in Africa. So this bird that might be outside my door right now will migrate 5,300 kilometers to sub-Saharan Africa to spend most of its life. And what we're going to do is follow it to Africa. So there's a white throat in the middle of Nigeria at the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute, where I do a lot of uh, a lot of my research. I wish it was the same white throat. How fantastic would that be? There is a person that has actually caught a sedge warbler in the UK. They caught it in Kent and then they went down to Senegal two months later to do some ringing in Senegal and they caught the same sedge warbler, pulled it out of the net. Incredible coincidence, but uh, it hasn't quite happened to me yet. That map on the right hand side is a hotspot diagram of the density of migrant birds. So our European birds in the non breeding season, you can see they're concentrated in a band along the whole of the middle of Africa and down East Africa in sub Saharan Africa. Lots and lots of migrant birds and lots of species. So what are these birds doing in Africa and the connection between all the migrants that end up in Africa and their declines might be what's going on in Africa. Now, you'll all have ideas. If you've been to Africa, perhaps you don't have these ideas. If you haven't, you might imagine it's full of giraffes and lions. And in fact, no, most of Africa is very much like Europe. It's a very anthropogenic habitat. There are lots of people. There's a lot of farmland. And if you're familiar with European vegetation, actually African vegetation looks pretty similar, except drier. The grass is almost always brown, except when it's not raining. At least when the migrants are there, it's not raining much. This is an example of some woodland in, in the north of Nigeria, just in the south of the Sahara. And you can easily imagine <clears throat> that these might be hawthorn bushes in the UK. It's a very similar habitat that you might find white throats in in Scotland. The only difference is, of course, the grass is brown. There's no there's no grass. And if you look at the two pictures on the left and right hand of the screen, what you see here is the change in the habitat that happens seasonally for these migrant birds. So they arrive at the end of the wet season when it's really quite lush. But by the time they leave, it looks more like the right right hand side. It's much, much drier. It hasn't rained. Uh, for six months. So that's one of the challenges they have to deal with and it immediately pops into your head that maybe conditions are a little bit hard for them. And there's the fact that most of the habitat in Africa, particularly West Africa where I work, is anthropogenically modified. There are lots and lots of people. I work in Nigeria, the most populous country uh, in Africa. Last census they came up with 180 million. It's probably more like 230 30 or 240 million people. They all need to eat. They're turning habitat into cropland. So if you walk through the African habitats where these migrants are, it is, it's pretty European. It's lots and lots of fields. It's more fields than natural habitat. And the migrants are in all of these spaces, these very, very anthropogenic spaces. So here's one of my study species, one of my favourite birds, although my favourite bird is actually the bird I'm looking at at the time. Um, a wind chat in a tomato field. Very, very intensive, lovely tomatoes being grown, but wind chat absolutely appears happy as Larry in there. So this goes against our idea of birds being at risk because of changing habitat, because of encroachment of humans. They're actually thriving where there are humans. But we need more information. So first thing we have to do is catch them. So how do you catch a bird? Well, in Africa, you do it the, pretty much the same way anywhere else. You put up mist nets. So we put up a load of nets and you hope that a bird will fly into it. They can't see it. You can catch them, doesn't hurt them. 
and you can see my colleague off there taking it very seriously, catching the birds with a lot of colour rings in front of him to turn them into individuals. And you can see he's taking anti-malarial precautions with his bottle of gin uh, on the table. Although when I gave this talk to, um, I think it was the Edinburgh uh, Women's Guild, a voice piped up from the background and said, it's not the gin, it's the tonic. So she was obviously very experienced in anti-malarial precautions. Which may explain why I've had malaria a couple of times. But. So we caught the bird and we put in colourings on. Colourings are no more or less than turning birds into individuals so that you can start to string together locations to find out where they live and to start follow, following their roots, work out what they need, work out why they die as individuals. So this bird is green metal, white, orange. Once they're individuals, then you can piece together individual lives. Now, this looks all very complicated, but essentially we've wandered around uh, part of northern Nigeria on the Niger border. And every time we've seen one of our colouring, in this case, wheat ears, we've just recorded the location. You can do this on, on your phone. This is at the time you're using a, a dedicated GPS. So all of these little um, designations are individuals. And then, of course, you can draw around their ranges and you can work out what they need. And the first thing that you find is they don't need very much. So that scale up there, 100 metres, these birds, these wheat ears that may have bred in Arctic Norway, come thousands of kilometres to Nigeria, are actually only hanging out in a very, very small space. Those of you looking at the photo top left, yes, there are camels in the background. So hazard if you're putting up mist nets, a camel in your mist net is a, a fairly, um, is an accident you can't go back from. So that was wheat ears. What about these other migrant species? So back to the white throats. Now white throats are a bit harder than uh, wheat ears. You can't see them because they like skulking in bushes. So when we catch them, we might put a radio transmitter on the back. And this is um, one of the more cutting edge transmitters that you can get. You can see there's a little solar panel on the back. So it should, in theory, have uh, an indefinite uh, life. You catch the white throat, you release it, and then you track it. And top right, you see Mohammed, uh, one of the master students uh, from Aplori, really excited to be living the dream and tracking uh, this white throat. This is what he's been dreaming of in terms of conservation research. Sadly for Mohammed, he soon confronted the reality of biological field, field work. And basically, if you're not bored by the second day, then you're doing it wrong. And his major discovery was that common white throats don't do a lot. And he became convinced that most of the birds he was tracking with were dead because he would go out every morning to the bush where they lived and he would get a beep, beep, beep signal to know the bird was in the bush repeated day after day after day. They didn't go anywhere. So common white throats, again, they're moving over the scale of five, six thousand kilometres between Europe and Africa. When they get to Africa, they're just hanging around in a bush about the size of an average uh, room, maybe a little bit bigger. One day, Mohammed got incredibly excited, came running up to me and said, well, well, it's moved. And we ran back to the bush. But unfortunately, by the time we got to the bush, the massive movement of the white throat of about 250 meters was over and it had returned it thought better of it and gone back to its bush another species same pattern wind chats again look at the scale they don't have circular territory that's just a we're just um, giving you kind of an average measure um, circular uh, idea of how far they move and again on a scale of less than 100 meters so look you've got lots of uh, wind chats some spaces where they're not there other spaces where they're at quite high density so we can then ask the question they love this particular spot they go back to Europe and then they come back to Africa do they go back to exactly the same spot and the answer is yes and it's unbelievable how site faithful they are. So here we have winter ranges in one season and I'll lay on top of it the winter ranges of a second season. And if you like, the difference in the overlap is simply measurement error. They go back to exactly the same place. 
But that's not the really incredible part of it. The incredible part of it is that half of the birds each year don't make it back. So if a bird returns to its territory exactly the same place the previous year, half of its neighbours have died. So those territories are unoccupied for a little bit before the juveniles come back and maybe occupy them. Yet these birds don't move. Clearly they can't all be in the best territory, so why aren't they moving? And also when you bear in mind you've got this big seasonal change. So wind chat territories in September on the left, lush green, looks like really easy living, but by March it looks really hard. But again, they're not moving. So what do we conclude? We conclude they don't need very much, that actually life is very easy. And of course that's very logical because why on earth are they flying to Africa anyway? All that effort, all that risk, if when they get to Africa, it's not a whole lot of fun. There's lots of food, it's not cold. And if a winchet's having a bad day, then it probably stays foraging until half past eight in the morning rather than stopping foraging at eight o'clock. It's very, very easy. The rest of the time they take off. So it doesn't look like what's killing the migrants is actually happening within Africa. We've got to look somewhere else. So let's look at migration. So how do we measure migration on these really small birds? Well, we need a tag. What I've put on this wind chats being held by one of my PhD students, Emma Blackburn, um, is a geolocator tag. Now this is an archival tag. These birds are too small to put on things like satellite transmitters. Now that would be really handy, but they weigh five, six grams, and the bird itself only weighs about 15 grams. Geolocator tags weigh about 0.4 of a gram, so we can just about get them on a bird without causing any, any ethical problems. Now these tags record sunrise and sunlight, uh, sunset, essentially light intensity, and they have a clock. And with those bits of information, you can work out longitude and you can also work out latitude most of the time. It's a bit flaky, but it's the best we can do. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is that they're archival tags. That means that they don't transmit the data. We have to catch the bird again one year later to recover the data. So the fact that they're coming back to the same place is obviously pretty darn crucial uh, in this. But we have to recatch it again. So we've got the birds tagged. They've flown off to Europe. Some of them have come back. The team's back on the, on the site. You've got Aaron, you've got Ben, you've got Malcolm. We're looking out for the birds. We get really excited. There it is. There's a bird come back. It's got a tag on. We can't wait to catch it. The only trouble is the wind chat has other ideas because we caught it last year and the process of catching a bird generally teaches it to become rather distrustful of the means that which you catch it. So if you catch a bird in a spring trap on the right hand side with a nice baited maggot, you might catch it within two minutes the first time, but you will never, ever, ever catch it again in a spring trap because it learns from that. So the next year, it's no good putting out a spring trap. You have to catch it in a mist net. But mist nets are visible. These birds are wary. They're actually cued into the fact that we're trying to catch them. And so they're hard to get. So some of these tags we don't get back, but you put the nets up before dawn, you work really hard because getting these tags back is incredibly valuable. So anyway, I finally caught the bird, checking its colorings, my heart's beating. The tag is still on the bird. Sometimes it loses the tag, I'm just cutting the little elastane straps that are holding it. So it's basically sitting as like a little backpack on its back with two loops around its, its legs. There's plenty of give in the elastane, so we know we know it doesn't um, harm them. Hand shaking slightly, cut it off. And there you have it, the tag. But of course, maybe the battery's failed. Maybe it hasn't quite worked. So you never know until you actually get back to base and start downloading the data. And the moment when it all pays off is when you see the data scrolling down on your computer. Now, this doesn't give you the locations. We've got to do a bit of analysis first, but it's an absolutely wonderful moment, especially when you can combine it with a donut and a cup of tea. So you run the numbers 
And this is the payoff. And this is some of the most exciting bits of research um, that I've done. All this investment, this tiny little tag, and then you turn that into adventures, adventures of these individuals. So you're looking here at two tracks from two tag birds, one from Liberia on the left and one from Nigeria from at Loy, uh, the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute I already mentioned, where I do a lot of my work. Um, track on the left crosses the Sahara, goes up the Iberian Peninsula, it bred in um, Arctic Russia really high above the Arctic Circle. We didn't think winchats were, were breeding that often up there, but we found a lot of our birds uh, were going up there. So in the middle of the summer, the tags are recording constant daylight. We actually can't work out where they are because it's just light all the time. I can only, I have to look at the periods um, at the beginning and the end of the summer where they're still up in the Arctic to actually work out latitude and longitude. Bird on the right, Nigeria. Um, didn't go so far. It's breeding on the uh, Ukraine uh, border, crosses the Sahara in a single bound, and then some other staging sites on the way. You tag enough of these birds, you start to make some general conclusions. Now, terms and conditions apply because we only get the birds that survive. So the birds that die, that have run into problems, I don't know what happens. But if you look at the ones that come back, you find they actually cinch the migration. They're not struggling to cross the Sahara. Lots of them cross the Sahara in a single flight. Um, sorry, they all cross the Sahara in a single flight, but many individuals continue over the Mediterranean as well. They've still got fuel in the tank to get all the way over to say Italy. Um, rather than stopping uh, to refuel in somewhere like uh, Tunisia. And some birds make, say, a migration from the middle of Nigeria to Moscow in less than two weeks, in 12 days. Absolutely incredible. Thousands of kilometres for a 15 gram bird. Although when they're migrating, they've added another 10 grams uh, of fat. So by and large, it doesn't look like migration itself is pushing them to their limits. Other thing we find out from the data is that if you tag birds from one location in Africa, you find that they're spread all the way over Europe. So here, the baseline spread of our tagged wind chats from a couple of years in uh, Nigeria was 2,100 kilometers. I'll come back to why that's important. So they migrate really well. And they appear to have a very easy life in Africa. These are absolutely amazing. So why are they declining? So something, even though they're resilient and they've got this fantastic adaptability, it has its limits. So first reason they're probably declining is that they rely on links in a chain. If you're a migrant, Yes, you can cross the Sahara successfully or the Mediterranean, but once you get to the other side, you have to stop and you have to refuel. So you rely on a site and then you move up into Europe. You stop at another site, you end up in your breeding ground, you breed there. And then, of course, you have to retrace your steps back and then you need a wintering ground. So you've got five or six sites that you rely on. And if any one of those sites drops out because somebody's plowed it up or something's happened along the way, then you're going to be in trouble. You're relying on it and suddenly that link in the chain's dropped out. If you live in one place, the probability that you're affected by any change is much less than if you live in a whole series of places. It's like rolling the dice uh, more times. Sooner or later you'll get a six. And this probably accounts to a large part for why migrants are declining. But the other reason is a little bit more subtle and relates to what we call connectivity. Now, connectivity is how connected migrants are on their breeding ground and their non-breeding ground. So what I've done here is plotted all the tracks of 101 land bird species that have ever been tracked in the same way that I showed you with the wind chat data over the last 20 or so years. It's almost, almost a, work, a work of art. And you can see they're tracked mostly on the breeding grounds and these tracks spread out across the wintering ground. And boy, do they spread out. Here's a 
wonderful example. This is one of the earliest bits of tracking uh, that was done. This is a great reed warbler. If you ever wonder why it's called a great reed warbler, it's because of its fantastically great migration, nothing to do with its size. Um, six birds, sorry, eight birds were caught within a single net within a reed bed in Denmark. So they were caught on a really small scale, all eight birds together. They were tagged and then they were re-caught again in the same net in the same place the following year. And those eight birds went all over Africa. So the baseline spread of them was 3,250 kilometers. So this is low connectivity. You can't join a place, say these birds breed here, they winter here because the birds winter all over Africa. And I'm sure you're making the connection and thinking, oh dear, this does create a problem because if I wish to look after my great reed warblers from my nature reserve in Denmark, I need to worry about the whole of Africa and changes that are occurring there. And when you look at what predicts the degree of spread for all of these migrant bird species, you find that they all spread out to a very large degree. There's some individual variation. Some species are more site specific than others, lower connectivity, um, sorry, higher connectivity, or others have much lower connectivity. But the species signal only counts for 25% of the variation. And geography counts for nearly 40%. Now, if you're wondering what I mean, Think back to what your grandmother probably told you and my grandmother certainly told me, birds fly south in winter. And that this very complicated analysis basically just confirms what my granny knew all along, that birds fly south in winter and they spread out across all available land. So the concept of migrant birds going to very specific places that you can conserve really breaks down. They spread out over all of Africa. They spread out over all of North America. Although in North America, it's perhaps higher connectivity because if you think about it, there's much less land available, particularly in Central America. So things get a little more concentrated. So on average, individuals from any population are spread out over continental wide scales in the non-breeding season. So you're thinking, why? Why would birds do that because surely it makes sense to be very specific. They're going to very specific places as individuals, but of course they're spread out to loads of these different spaces, uh, places as a population. Why haven't they just worked out where the best places are to go? And to understand this, you have to think about climate change, but climate change in a good way. I know you don't often hear that uh, phrase. Now, Climate change is usually portrayed as some kind of dreadful thing happening. And indeed, in context, I first encountered climate change was a shift from very dry conditions in Africa uh, to more wetter conditions um, in the early 90s. And this was a very depressing paper that I read in 2005, which very accurately predicted climate change, um, historical climate change in the areas where these migrants winter, projected it into the future, and it was grim. It was going to get worse. Very depressing. But luckily, I hang on, and I read this paper the following year, which very, very accurately predicted the historical trajectory of climate in Africa, but predict predicted exactly the opposite in the future, that it was going to get wetter. And if you average all of the climate model projections in the areas where these migrants go, they average out as no change at all because there are just as many saying it's going to get wetter as just as many saying that it's going to get drier. So what's my point here? My point here is life is uncertain. There's a huge amount of climate change going on in Africa anyway, and we've absolutely no idea what's going to happen. So if we have no idea what's going to happen, then these birds have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. You'll be thinking ahead of me, so they need to hedge their bets. Let me show you the, the degree of climatic variation we have in Africa. So black dots where it's raining in Africa and 
the uh, open small dots are where it's not raining. So here we are, 1950 to 1959, it's raining in the Sahel. It's quite wet where the migrants are, also down in south, um, southern Africa. Now it's shifted to East Africa the next decade. Shifted to Southern Africa, we've now got that drought. Shifted again. And if I run that back, it's the nature of Africa. You get more variation in climate on a decadal basis in Africa than we might anticipate is gonna happen in Europe over the next 100 years under the most dire climate change scenarios. Africa is climate change. And this is where the migrants are going. And it's not just on a decadal basis. If you've ever flown across the Sahara, look out of the window. It's riverbed after dry riverbed. Evidence of lakes, evidence of wetlands where there were hippos. There are hippo bones all the way across the Sahara. Five and a half thousand years ago, there was a profound shift from a very mesic wet environment to a very dry environment. And of course, the migrant birds, they've been migrating backwards and forth all that time. They've compensated, they've dealt with it. So how does it work, this low connectivity, high connectivity argument? Well, imagine conditions are shifting. Imagine you're a willow warbler breeding in Europe and you're migrating to Africa. You have a brood of offspring, five or six chicks, and they all head off in different directions. And if you have shifting conditions, some of them will hit the target, even if it shifts from year to year. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. They're hedging their bets. So it's a good strategy when you can't really predict what the climate is going to be on a decadal basis. Of course, what this means for us is trying to conserve. If we put nature reserves in the environment in Africa, then some of our willow warblers will hit the target, hit our nature reserves. That's great. But of course, if we have shifting conditions, then our nature reserves might be in the wrong place in the future. So it's a good idea to have a whole network of nature reserves across a large area to encompass the shifting climatic conditions. So there low connectivity they're spreading out is an adaptation to the climatic variability, the unpredictability in Africa. It's a good thing. But let's lay on the top of it another issue, anthropogenic habitat change. There are lots of people in Africa I've already mentioned and they need to live. They need to have a quality of life and that has an impact on the environment. And quite clearly, if some guys come in and start chopping down uh, Sahelian forest, it has an effect on Sahelian forest birds. So this is a European bird species, subalpine warbler. I visited, first visited Nigeria in 1993, visited a place called Watch Coal, lovely piece of uh, Sahelian woodland. This is in the north of Nigeria, at the time you could visit the north of Nigeria and come back and tell the tale. Um, and lots of subalps and lots of trees. I returned 2002, there were many fewer trees, and many fewer subalpine warblers. Yeah, it's not rocket science, but quite satisfying that that uh, what we predicted, although deeply unsatisfying that our model had been proved because I'd rather the forest and the subalps were still there. So the habitat's being degraded. So what happens if you've got this high spread and a decreasing area? Well, then you have a problem because the target is not shifting, the target is getting smaller. So a greater proportion of your offspring miss the target. And so they're much less likely to find somewhere suitable uh, to spend the non-breeding season, or they're gonna have lower body condition before migration and so on. So it just takes off percentage points on their survival. So they're Migrant birds are between a rock and a hard place because the climate, shifting climate in Africa means that they have to maintain this low connectivity to ensure that some individuals end up in the right place in the future. But that strategy is the worst strategy to have if you're losing habitat, if you have anthropogenic habitat change, then the best strategy is to keep going back to the bits that are still there. 
so the strategy is no longer fit for purpose. And so the fact we see similar levels of high connectivity across all the migrants, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in North America, may help explain migrant declines generally. Why things like swifts, why corncrakes, why willow warblers, why spotted flycatchers, why swallows, very, very different birds ecologically are all declining. It's because they're all going to Africa, spreading over a wide area, and little by little, Africa is being chipped away, habitats being lost, so the populations are declining. So this isn't actually anything very odd happening. What we're doing, the reason we're seeing these migrants decline is because we're simply monitoring the declines in African birds. Now, last century, we monitored the declines in European birds for exactly the same reasons. We had agricultural intensification, increasing populations and demands on the land. And so all of our bird populations in Europe have gone down. The same thing's happening in Africa. It's just the only species uh, that we're actually monitoring are the migrant species that come to uh, Europe. So to finish up, what do we need to do about this? How can we change this? It's inevitable in the sense that we've got increasing human pressure uh, in Africa. Well, we need sustainable development, not just protected areas. We, these birds are filling in the cracks, much like they do in Europe. They're nesting in gardens, farmlands, very anthropogenic habitats in Europe. The same thing applies in Africa, but we need to leave sufficient space. But one of the problems is that there's nobody there to actually record this kind of information to feed into sustainable development and um, conservation within the area. There's a very limited pool of local ornithological expertise. And so that's the other part of what I do is not just monitoring the decline, but trying to do something about it by trying to increase awareness and by trying to increase the capacity by trying to train up people like Mohammed or Gus Azilia, guy on the right, the first person in Nigeria um, to get an ornitholo ornithological PhD. Um, and we do this through just straightforward teaching, capacity building. Um, I helped set up the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute in about 2001, 2002, and we teach 10 or so master students um, every year. And these students have gone on to all, go all over Africa to do positive things for conservation through increasing awareness and so on. Um, here are seven, 77 students that I've got good information for their, for their um, destinations now, 2003 to 2015. So you've got them in conservation NGOs, university positions or schools influencing the next generation or in government, which is really important. Mohammed went on to manage the National Park Network for the north of uh, Nigeria, for example. Lots of them, 50% of our graduates go on to do PhDs outside of uh, Nigeria, outside of West Africa, but every single one of them, apart from one, has returned to West Africa or Africa to apply their conservation knowledge. If you're a medical doctor, you have skills that are valuable throughout the world, perhaps your temptation to, to go back um, to Africa is less. But if you're a conservation biologist, a Nigerian conservation biologist, really your biggest need, people want you most within Nigeria, within West Africa. And has this worked? I show you this. I, as part of a thought experiment, which I turned into a real experiment, and this is my pretty much my last slide, I plotted the number of ornithological papers that have been produced in Nigeria with time and compared it to the rest of West Africa. And you can see that when we started the decade before Aplori, Nigeria is producing pretty much the same as all the other West African countries, which is almost nothing in terms of ornithology, conservation related science to help migrant birds, if you like. But then we 
founded at Lori and it shot up. And if you look at the right hand panel of this slide, I'm comparing the output of number of ornithological papers in Europe with that of West Africa. Clearly Europe is ahead for any number of reasons, but look at that top line. It's overtaken the poorest performing country in Europe and that's Nigeria and that's entirely to do with that glory. Anyway, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. That's fascinating and sort of alarming, but also encouraging in, in equal measure, perhaps. It seems like the uh, the diagnosis is quite is pretty clear, even if the uh, the implementation of the of the treatment uh, uh, has has a number of challenges. Um, we've got a number of questions uh, stacking up. Um, I'm just going to kick off with one. Um, your your talk um, focused quite a lot on on African uh, migratory species, um, but you did show a couple of maps uh, showing. Uh, uh, illustrations of, of uh, uh, American uh, migration. Uh, are, they, are they very similar or are there, are there significant differences between the two uh, two continents? There, there, are, there are some very in, interesting differences. When I came into this this field, I, I, I found a, quite a bit of pushback, particularly from um, my North American colleagues when I started talking about low connectivity. Uh, saying, you know, what are you talking about? We've got very high high connectivity. And indeed, there are several American species which do have what you call high connectivity. There's a species called a prothonathery warbler, which is incredible, which just winters in one very small area of Colombia, but spreads out over, you know, a large, large chunk of the US. So it's like funneling down into an air, in into an, an area. But then when I did the analysis of looking at geography, it all clicked into place. And the thing is, if you overlay Central America and the top of um, North America, uh, South America onto the Sahara, it, West Africa, it just disappears. There's actually very little land. So yes, these birds do spread out, but you know they don't swim. So they end up on Cuba or they end up on the narrow uh, uh, isthmuses and so on uh, in, in Central America. So you end up with higher connectivity, but it's not because these birds are if you like, have been selected to go to particular areas. It's just they're constrained. Thank you. Um, here's a question from uh, Anonymous, uh, which relates to uh, to arable farming. I think it's something we're all fam familiar with in uh, in Europe and the, the concerns that, that intensive uh, arable farming in particular is not necessarily beneficial. but. Uh, this question is, are, are crop fields reasonable habitats due to less intensive pesticide and fertilizer use? But I think so. I think the question is, are more sustainable arable farming methods helping? Yes, it is, is, is the very short answer to that. Um, the more intensive the, the farmland, the better it is for growing food. And so there, there are two sort of School, schools of thought about how, how we should conserve. There's this idea of land sparing, which is you grow crops really intensively in an area, forget about wildlife, and you have nature reserves. And then there's land sharing, where you might say have less uh, intensive farming, organic farming, with space for wildlife in there. And But then of course you need more land, and there's less land for nature reserves. So it's obviously a trade-off. But if you're talking about migrants in particular, and in fact, a whole suite of species, it's no good having nature reserves. You need to have this land sharing thing. But, uh, but I'd argue that we probably need land sharing as well, because if people are to engage with wildlife, if people are to experience nature, there are lots of reasons to do it. You know, I'm crazy about birds because I just like them, but even people that don't know much about birds generally have better mental health and enjoy life more if they live in a nice natural environment. So if we're pushing wildlife into nature reserves that are away from people, that might be a great solution, but it's not such a great solution for people. So I would advocate that land sharing because migrant birds, yeah, they need less intensive agriculture, but also because humans need to experience less intensive. Um, the places they live have to have nature uh, as well. 
because there's connectivity here, not just between Europe and Africa for white throats, there's connectivity between people and nature. And there's also connectivity between me teaching in St Andrews and teaching in Nigeria. And it's the same birds. I talk, talk to my Nigerian students about their white throats. I talk to Scottish students about their white throats. They're our white throats. It links, links us. Indeed, thank you. Um, I've got two questions here um, along similar lines. So from Trevor uh, and also from Vincent, uh, who's in Mauritius. Um, have you studied any, any maritime species, uh, uh, for example, the Arctic tern? Um, and basically the same, same question from Vincent, Vincent and Mauritius. So um, migratory seabirds. So uh, I've, I've, stuck to, I've stuck to land, land birds rather than seabirds because the, there is a, I don't know, there, there's, a, there's a kind of di dichotomy in, in ornithologists. They tend to either, either go, go for seabirds big time or they tend to go for land birds big time. Of course, the other one is birds of, um, birds of prey. Um, so the short answer is no, I haven't done it. What, um, do these kind of principles apply? Yes, they massively do. Um, have I applied them yet to seabirds? No, I, no, I haven't. And I don't have, really have a good excuse why, why I haven't, apart from the fact I like land birds. Seems fair enough. Um, uh, again, another pair of questions, uh, one from Justin uh, and another and, and a similar one from Anonymous. Um, we hear a lot about bird hunting in some southern European countries. Is this a significant problem for migrant bird decline or is it overstated? Um, and, uh, um, and the other questioner uh, mentions Malta in particular. Um, I haven't talked much about this as a, as a problem, except in the general context of the chain link hypothesis. Remember that white throats relying on a series of series of sites and that's where bird hunting really is is a problem. And we have now some very good empirical evidence that several European bird species are declining at an unsustainable rate, i.e. heading for extinction because of hunting. Uh, turtle doves, European turtle doves being one, Autolam, the uh, Western population of Autolam being, uh, being another. Um, Generally, the hunting of migrant birds is not justified in the sense that the populations can survive it. It's not sustainable. And where it may have been a cultural part of people's culture in, in the past, it's now being run in, in a way that's very akin to selling arms or selling drugs. Uh, it's a criminal activity. Um, some very, very nasty people doing it, making an awful lot of a lot of money, both in Malta, uh, in Cyprus, uh, in Egypt. And um, it's having a dreadful effect on some migrant bird species. And it's not a very nice, uh, nice activity. Um, it's not overstated at all. If anything, it's understated because people don't want to step on people's cultural um, you know, tradi traditions, but some cultural traditions are not fit for purpose. And this is this is one of them. Thanks. That's, uh, I suspect that's something we could talk about for some time, but I think we'd we'd, uh, we'd better take some more. Um, this is a question from Eleanor, which is very interesting. Uh, did you notice a difference in survival rates of tag wearing first winter birds as opposed to older adult birds, with, uh, particularly windchats and wheat ears? Oh, great, um, great, great question. One of the one of the biggest problems as a scientist is you need to measure things from your animals, but the process of measuring them changes their behaviour. And a sticking a tag on a bird, you know, they're not used to carrying little backpacks when they migrate, is an obvious one that maybe their migration routes are going to be compromised, their survival is going to be compromised, and the question is more subtle than that because you might expect a stronger effect on young birds which have had less experience if you put put tags on them. We were tagging on the wintering ground um, and we were tagging juvenile birds, i.e. ones that were only about six months old and birds that were um, 18 months old or, or older, which we'll call adults, and we found no difference, no difference in survival at all. What 
that the difference in survival between adults and juveniles for migrants seems to happen on the first migration. So we've shown that very strongly in wind chats. We've just confirmed that with uh, white throats um, as well. It's the first migration. Can you imagine if you're born a wind chat in the Ukraine and you've got to get to Nigeria or anywhere in Africa? There's no one to guide you. There's no other parent to guide. The parents go before the jobs and it's it's a tricky business and that's where the mortality happens. But once they get to Africa, hardly any of them die on the wintering ground and then there's exactly the same survival rate for tag birds or, or untagged birds, which are control group going to Europe and back again in that first year after six months. Thank you. Um, a question from John, which I guess speaks to that that sort of uh, uh, what what lay people like me think of as this great sort of mystery of of of, <laughs> of the migratory instinct. How good is the research explaining how exactly these birds can navigate so accurately to the same locations uh, year on year? Um, now, that that's another that's another very good question because, of course. If I my means of studying and understanding the migration is I need to rely on birds to come back to exactly the same place to recover their tags, then it kind of becomes a self self-fulfilling prophecy. So you need more subtle, subtle ways and indeed non-archival tags, ones that broadcast the position live to to answer that that question. So yes, there's a there's a bias in terms of site fidelity at the moment and the, the more you look at within a population, and we're finding this with wind chats and, and white throats, and of course there are species which are also more mobile, like the great reed wall, as I showed, showed you that, which are less site faithful and also will move sites uh, within um, the non-breeding season. But by and large, you know, you should never you know, judge an individual by, by a, a group mean, and of course you start generalizing, there are always exceptions, but by and large, it makes sense for a migrant bird to revisit what worked for them the previous year. Because remember that juvenile bird flying off to Africa, it's got no idea what's happening. It gets experience. Don't the following year then just do that crazy adventure again. Go back to what you know, because that allowed you to survive. Repeat the survival, because although they can't predict climate, on a decadal basis, it's a pretty good bet that a site in the previous year is still good in the next year. It's not good on a generational basis for the birds, but yeah, repeat, stick stick with what you know. But so yes, I suppose, I, sorry. <laughs> I, I was just, I was just gonna say, I take, I take, um, I take the point in, in the question that yes, that there, there's a bias. I, I think the question may have been also just about, do, do we really know what the, what the navigational what navigational mechanisms are being used and, so and, <laughs> um as a, yeah there's always a, always a danger of getting getting carried away in my job and i apologize i apologize for that yeah the navigational mechanisms now that's a, a whole other can can of worms and we really need another talk talk or two um ab about that um one of my colleagues uh uh casper thorup um, described it that birds, migrant birds, these small birds have the equivalent of a GPS in their head. They know exactly where they are on the planet at all times. That doesn't mean they know where to go. You have to have experience to know, uh, know where you go, but they know where they are. And there are a whole variety of mechanisms that might do it. Some of them, you know, look at look at the arrangement of the constellation. Some of them are looking at sunrise and sun, sunset. Others are detecting magnetic fields. Others are just simply using landmarks. They use a whole range of uh, range of things. And we're also discovering, you know, even even now discovering very, very subtle mechanisms, um, sensory mechanisms going on in birds' brains for de detecting differences in magnetic field. Um, uh, for for example, so yes, I can't you know I can't tell you all about all all about the me mechanisms now, but it is absolutely brilliant the spatial sense that these birds have. If I was to take a wind chat from Liberia and displace it to Nigeria, it might migrate to Europe, 
go to where it bred before, but it will go back exactly to where it was in Liberia the following year. And I haven't done that experiment, but other people have. Thanks. Um, so somewhat related um, and, and perhaps a uh, uh, close to your heart as a as a as a birder. Um, are vagrant birds lost or are they making an evolutionary choice? <laughs> Um, they're making an evolutionary choice and some of them are definitely lost. Um, if you spread out, if you've got low, low connectivity, some of those birds are just, you know, heading off into the Atlantic and that and that's it. But some of those birds will get lucky, maybe end up on the Canaries or whatever. And there is no equivalent ecological species there. And if it's a storm event where like a, a small group of birds get blown over, um, then you've got a population and then you might have colonization and eventually you might have speciation. I mean, this is the whole root of Darwin's theory of evolution and the, uh, the Galapagos finches, this this whole idea. So we see I'm a bird watcher. I absolutely love the fact that where I live on the east coast of Scotland, if the east winds come in, you know, birds from all over the world, from Japan, whatever, from Vietnam might turn up in my garden. And you sort of think, oh, terrible weather conditions, they're lost whatever, but some of those birds may find a way. And of course, they can retrace their steps back to where they breed and they can go come back again. And so new evolution, uh, new migration routes are formed. So yeah, vagrancy is, it's a bit of a hit and miss strategy, but it is a evolutionary strategy. So if they're, if they're successful, then, then a toehold uh, might be achieved in that new, in that new territory. So that I mean, the, this overarching point that I mean, we always think about climate change as being a very modern and human phenomenon. But if you look at Africa and you look at climate change in Africa, we've had nothing to do with this climate change. You know, you can relax. That's the way it is. And these birds have adapted to it. And then you put bigger geological timescales on it. Ice ages. These birds have adapted. And that's the thing about migrants. They are the ultimate toolkit in a little bird's head to deal with fantastic climate change, which is why it's ironic that climate change is anthropogenic. The climate, sorry, that anthropogenic habitat change that we're doing is, if you like, turning that super advantage they have into a bit of a disadvantage. And um, again, this is sort of along the same lines, but a slightly different question. Um, you know that you, you show those very striking uh huge uh, uh, ranges of, of, of sorry yeah large con large connectivity yeah across in the, low, in the connectivity, yeah. low connectivity sorry yes um but but then the, the uh, coming back to the to the the um uh, specific wintering sites so question from carrie c the birds are so faithful to their specific winter sites are they completely doomed if they return to a degraded site? And is there any uh, individual flexibility within individual uh, animals, uh, maybe to keep looking just a little bit further for, for somewhere better? Yes, um, that, that's exactly what, what must, must happen. And that's, uh, that's where I hit, hit the limits of, of what I can do as a scientist at the, at the moment, because the moment the bird makes a decision to leave where I'm studying it, it effectively disappears because even if it's got one of my tags on, I don't know what it's doing unless it comes back. So if it permanently moves, and if it, even if it only moves half a kilometre out of my study, study site in Africa, it's effectively lost. I might you know, occasionally pick up ones at, at, at greater uh, distance. So I Yes, there must be this flex flexibility. It would crazy crazy if there isn't there in, a, in an evolutionary kind of kind of argument. It's a very easy thing to do, particularly when they move over such a big spatial scale. And we do find evidence, as I say, of multiple site use, serial residency within individuals, um, in in species. So no, they're not doomed. Abs absolutely not doomed. But the degree, you see, life's a trade off, and then you die, obviously. Um, so a bird's trading off what it knows with the unknown, and it's the unknown that kills them, that first migration that kills them. So they are reluctant to move, but obviously if they come back and the habitat's gone, then they will move. But um, wind chats, quite amazing. They turn up in 
the beginning of the uh, non-breeding period in maize fields, set up territories. The maize is harvested and then the fields burn and the windchamp's still in the field four months later in the soot, still apparently having having fun. So they are they are very resilient and they are reluctant to move, but I think they can. Thank you. Um, this is going to have to be the last question, which is uh, deeply regrettable because uh, there are stacks of really interesting uh, questions which we're having, going to have to leave unanswered. But um, this is one which I think uh, is, is another fascinating question and uh, uh, a slightly different uh, topic. What about sleeping during migration? Do flying birds sleep with half their brains? Um, I, I ought to know the exact answer. Uh, to that one, um, but I but I don't. Um, I think the last last thing I, I read it, read about that is that it's probably a, a limitation in the sense that they don't do that, and so a lot of the stopovers that we see for migrants, um, you can sometimes pick it up on geolocators, but not not often. But certainly archival tags, uh, sorry, non archival tags, satellite tags on larger birds, a bird might spend two or three hours late afternoon just down on the ground and they're not foraging and they're probably having a sleep then just like us, a little bit tired, they need to you know, rest the brain. And then as it as night falls, they then go off on the next leg of their migration. So effectively, they're migrating constantly, but they just stop for these short um, short rest and, and sleep period. Some birds do sleep on the wing, um, swifts do, but I think they sleep with a whole brain because they don't keep flying, they just kind of fall <laughs> and then they wake up and go back up again and then they doze off again. So uh, it's not like dolphins, I think dolphins are a bit special. And that's, uh, that's a whole other uh, that's a whole other saints talk on uh, on, on sea mammals, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Yannick uh, covered uh, quite recently. Actually, uh, Will, thank you so much. That's been thank absolutely you. fascinating, and uh, thank you for giving up your your valuable time. Um, thank you to everyone who's asked questions, and apologies to those who who haven't uh, we haven't had the time to answer them. Um, uh, please do uh, keep an eye out for uh, future Saints talks. Uh, the next one uh, will be Professor Richard Watmore, who's our um, Chair of Modern History uh, in the School of History, and that's on the 5th of October. Um, so if you are signed up to uh, receive updates about these, you should uh, uh, you should hear about that. But for now, um, thank you to, to the, the team in the background who've kept us all uh, in line, Audrey, uh, Robbie and Kirsty. And once again, thank you so much uh, to Professor Will Cresswell for uh, a fascinating talk. Thank you.